This is an exclusive presentation of the Foreign Press Association. It gives me great pleasure to, um, b b both, uh, as, as John implied, uh, li living long enough to see the impending downfall of capitalism as we see it, or something like that. <laughs> but uh, more, more to the point is, um, I've always thought of it, e e e economics is a science on a par with phrenology or astrology. You can always justify anything with it retrospectively. And what's always impressed me about John and his work and his columns is um, he was in China, so he picked up the Maoist doctrine of seeking truth from facts. <laughs> so he always has copious charts and diagrams. And is, it does not follow the fashion because so much of what we see as economics is boosterism by politicians or companies. Mm. Um, you know, for years they believed that share buybacks are wonderful until you discover that none of the companies have any money left to deal with a crisis like this because they've spent it all on share buybacks to incentivize their directors. Well, yeah. you know, John has always called these orthodoxies into question. I don't think I'm getting into too much trouble here. And uh, <laughs> has accurately sort of predicted and punched, punched the holes in economic orthodoxy or rather in um, columnist columna orthodoxy right. uh, as the chattering classes uh, have continually echoed whatever the government wants them to or what the businesses want them to or the chamber of commerce wants them to so um john you know you must be sort of almost ap apart mm. from worried about whether you're going to survive the next few weeks like the rest of us um at, at seeing all the th all the things that you've been saying suddenly coming true and people dancing on standing on their heads uh, compared with where they were a month ago John, it's over to you. Well, the, the, <laughs> well, it's true that it's it's true that uh, I have been very negative in predicting that uh, that markets are overblown and set up for a very serious decline for a long time. You won't find anything in what I have predict what I have written that uh, predicting that a virus would take hold in Wuhan, central China, in December 2019, and that this, this would be the agent of uh, agent of the uh, Wipeout in share values that we've seen in the last few months. Like the, there's a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to claim superior knowledge to anybody else about that. But I think, um, I think, what does make a big difference if we, if you want to start out by talking about markets and the impact that this has had on markets so far, and. Um, yes, I'm cynical or sceptical about markets, but they still tend to work pretty darn well at divining what's going on. They, uh, you know, this is where people have an opportunity to actually make or lose money, and they are more likely to make or lose money if they call what is going on correctly. So they, they tend to be quite a, a good truth teller despite everything else. Um, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, Winston Churchill said, democracy is the worst way of running a country apart from all the others. Well, you know, capital markets are the worst way of allocating money, except that, you know, they do a lot of the time work fairly well. Now, what is interesting, what matters about the scale of the losses, which is underway at present, is the degree, there's a phrase uh, that somebody used to me once, when, when you're worried about, um, an impending credit crisis or an impending financial crisis. The question is always cheche le leverage. Not great French. Um, <laughs> pardon my French. Uh, but the idea being, and particularly my apologies to any French members who are on the call, but the, the, um, uh, the point is that if you have heavy amounts of leverage built up, that is a very much riskier situation because people really expect to have their debts repaid in a way that they don't necessarily rely on share prices to be maintained at a high level. And when you have uh, debts failing to be repaid, that creates uh, a cascade of losses elsewhere, on the, elsewhere in the system in a way that is uh, much more damaging than if you simply have a straightforward speculative loss. If you want to think of the last two big crises, um, in the year 2000, you had the bursting of the dot-com bubble, which is probably the most absurd uh, speculative mania in human history. In, 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 the, I won't bore you with all the way with the black this, but it, 
<laughs> yes, yes, uh, yes. It's, it, it, it's. Um, I mean, at least tulips were pretty. I mean, you know, some of those tulips that the Dutch were paying a lot of money for were very, very pretty tulips. Um, but because there was the money had been raised largely from equity investors hoping to make money rather than from banks, um, it caused a minor recession, and that was about all. Whereas um, in the case of the 2007-2008 financial crash, that was all about leverage. Uh, obviously, this, this was about a, a bubble in terms of extension of mortgage lending, and that created very serious losses that very clearly, very directly threatened the entire global financial system at one point. Now, what we've seen since, what we have entering this crisis and what is the reason for great concern that a public health crisis will become a, uh, an economic crisis, it's already a financial crisis. The problem is that we do, in fact, have huge amounts of leverage. The, the idea back in 2008 was that this was the opportunity for a decade of deleveraging, that uh, um, the central banks were printing money and making it easier for people slowly and surely to process their losses to, uh, to uh, get their debt back to a manageable level. And that's exactly what didn't happen. What you instead saw was a switch of the leverage and a move of the leverage away from um, American banks towards American companies, towards the US government, and also in particular towards China. China was really not a very indebted country at all 10 or 11 years ago. Uh, its growth since the financial crisis of 08 uh, has been very much fueled by debt. So you now have a position where um, the US corporate sector is more indebted than it's ever been before, where Europe similarly is, is very heavily indebted and where the most powerful growing country uh, on the planet, China, is also now in a position where it is very reliant on debt, where you, you can get into arguments about whether there are ghost cities or, or whatever that, Plainly, there's been a lot of credit extended and there has to be very real reason for concern about whether that can be repaid. Um, that is essentially why after the initial shock of grasping that the uh, virus wasn't just a Chinese issue, that it was coming to Europe and it was coming to North America, you have then had the extent of the knock-on uh, market effects in the last month and why you've seen so much desperate activity by the Federal Reserve and you know, increasingly now also by politicians. Could, That's could you not... elaborate on, on the issue that you raised there? Because uh, yeah. Mitch McConnell raised some uh, risibility uh, on, um, yeah. on, on, on the social media yesterday when he said in shocked tones in front mm. of the Senate that uh, because of their delay, the futures markets were affected. I yeah. mean... And it, <laughs> The, the, my, you know, be still my beating heart. <laughs> um, but what this is a, a perhaps you can explain just how much connection is there between the financial markets and the real economy? At what point do the two start, you know, as in the Great Depression, in, yes. in impacting on each other and uh, <laughs> leveraging and accelerating each other? So, uh, okay, the, in the case of when the financial market impacts the real economy, it's when banks fail. It's when, when there is no longer credit to be extended. That's what people really need to keep the economy humming along. Uh, if there is no longer an availability to, to, to take out a mortgage, to finance buying a car, um, all those various other things, that will very swiftly cause a, a very serious slowdown in the economy, which is basically what happens uh, in 08, 09, that it was much harder to get credit and things seized up for a while. There is a very great risk of that happening. Secondly, in terms of the movement in the other direction, yes, you're, you're quite right. The real economy can hum along very, uh, in a very mediocre and bland fashion for a very long time, and that can still 
support um, great performance for asset prices in the markets. That's what's happened in the last decade in the States. Um, but there are limits. Um, when you have serious decline in economic activity, which also means a serious decline in corporate profits, then that is a problem for markets. Um, at the moment, uh, there's also this irritating market cliche, but it's, it is true and it's hard to avoid, which is that there is nothing markets like less than uncertainty. Uh, and uncertainty is radical at present. Plainly, you know, I'm not an expert on epidemiology and the coronavirus, but we all, or everybody on this call has been informing themselves about this of late. It's still conceivable it won't be so much worse in the US than seasonal flu. It's still possible it's going to kill millions. Um, and where it lies in between that has an immense impact on all kinds of things. Um, while there is doubt about that, um, when you're investing in markets, you care about the future. You, 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 everything that's already in the price is what you've bought. What you're hoping for is to generate a return in the future. If you have that kind of doubt about whether this is really, you know, whether this is going to be, um, you know, a, a bad few months and a recession that will be over once we can all come out of our oddly induced hibernation by the end of the year, or whether it's going to be a repeat of the depression, you really don't know what to put into any particular kind of asset. Investment How do you factor the, the lockdown? I mean, uh, the, mm. you referred to my, uh, <laughs> my revolutionary youth. Uh, a general yeah. strike lasting a month. That's what we're facing almost, in a way. So, yes. you know, a a, a, a I'm not quite sure whether to be out on the street with a red banner cheering or say, whoops. <laughs> um, it's, yes, I mean, that, that, that's what it is. And it's very hard to, 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 uh, to monitor. But obviously, the amount of economic activity. Um, uh, I mean, I, I'm in Manhattan. Uh, I did venture out of the house yesterday. I mean, it doesn't feel like Manhattan. Uh, at all at this point. Um, the degree of shutdown is such that it can only have a huge impact on the economy. Uh, and you're seeing estimates, I I've not seen any estimates of less than 10% declines for the uh, economy in the second quarter. I've seen some estimates, I mean these are from, from Wall Street, so I'm just checking my uh, numbers here. I think I've seen uh, seen estimates of as much as 16% down. Uh, there's also the suggestion that we'll have 30% uh, unemployment in the second quarter, uh, by the end of the second quarter, which is uh, close to unfathomable. You know, no, no member of the club of, of, uh, of uh, developed nations has had unemployment anything like that since the war. Um, and that's the US is not alone, alone now, though. I mean, Italy, Spain, Britain, and others uh, are joining in, and the Chinese possibly yet. Germany, and, and you saw um, some of the, <coughs> the, the basic in economic indicators we get out of trying to suggest, you know, for the, the first two months of the year, a massive hit to economic activity for China. Uh, and a lot now depend, like, like I, for, off the top of my head, I think over 20% decline in industrial output and a very large decline in uh, consu consumption. So that then gives you the uh, issue of how uh, quickly China can recover. Again, at this point, there is very little to go on in terms of how quickly economic activity can resume, having been mothballed to this extent. Um, but I do find the idea that consumption is just being deferred um, a little um, over-optimistic. You, you, if you normally eat out twice a week um, and for a month you can't eat out at all because you're stuck in the house, that doesn't mean you eat out four times a week every week you know, for four weeks thereafter. Um, you're more likely just to return to normal. Um, 
if you cancel your vacation this year, it's gone, um, and so on. Uh, that a lot of a lot of consumption is just going to be uh, cancelled rather than deferred. Um, Especially, if, if I may say, it, don't, there's, there's the shift to the yeah. service economy. I mean, it's it's a uh, yes. Uh, how much telephone sanitising and um, the other so yeah. the manicuring and the other services like the food exactly that you expect, which and they form a huge proportion of the modern uh, industrial economies. Exactly, and the notion of yes more than 70 percent and and in general they uh, you're quite right very very important further point of weeks um you can close down service economies very quickly indeed because uh if not made any commitments to your workers for for large in large part how easily you can get them started again afterwards is a question we cannot yet answer people are going to get into the habits of doing something else um and so you know, the, the uh, how quickly we, we're seeing how suddenly you can stop activity but it's, again it's imponderable exactly how quickly you can restart it now that's again um i think most of us um morally uh would the, the line still seems to be holding that human lives, public health matter more than the economy. Um, there are a few more dissenting political voices now than they were a week or so ago um, about the, you know, what now that people are realizing how drastic the changes to our behavior need to be to, to, uh, um, to combat the virus. But, but broadly speaking, once we've, closed down voluntarily closed down our own economy like this it's very hard to see how you can uh, how you can recover swiftly i suppose the other point as well is in the case of um in the case of previous the, the, the closest the closest parallels if there are any um are world wars when you move on to uh uh a kind of command economy for a while large sectors of the economy have to be forcibly closed down um and you, people are mobilized in particular ways uh, but even then yes you did get very swift reconstruction after the the, the two world wars um it's not clear that it, you would have the same opportunities this time as you had um after after the after the wars it's it's a it's a messier situation declaring a victory over a virus rather than over another country for a start and you don't have the same degree of uh, of physical reconstruction to uh, to do so um you know when you have this degree of total uncertainty about what lies in future capitalism really has a problem dealing with it it's very difficult to allocate any capital to anybody um and then that again leads to the the, the problem that uh, uh, arguably your revolutionary youth you, would, you you might well have argued this is a flaw in capitalism that that, that uh, uh, at this point the private sector really has no incentive to do anything at all but there is a need for somebody to spend something to stop the economy from from seizing up totally that is why very strangely um you can see um the markets effectively asking the government to intervene um i mean the, the clearest way of demonstrating that is uh, what's been the most important driver for for markets in the last month uh, is is if you look at the american bond market which is how you know uncle sam funds borrowing um yields uh, uh i'm not sure how uh, versed people are in the in, in the in the technical vocabulary yield uh, the yield on a uh, uh on a on a bond is the effective interest rate you get it so if the price of the bond goes up the yield comes down um yields dropped below one percent for the first time ever in the last month which means people desperately bought 
a lot of bonds, lent, you know, effectively they bought a lot of the government's debt and they didn't mind only being compensated with a yield of less than 1% in return. And what that says is, first of all, we, the people who are buying all these bonds, despair of the chances of anybody making any money in any corporations for a while, so we'll just shelter in bonds. But it's also telling the government, dear government, borrow as much as you like. We're prepared to lend to you at less than 1%. Um, so you do actually have a fairly clear signal from the capital markets, even the capital markets, want the government to take a more active role at this point. It's a, a fascinating juncture in human affairs. You know, well, we're seeing Boris Johnson <laughs> effectively stealing Jeremy Corbyn's clothes on the, in terms of uh, green economy, government spending, all of the rest of it. So uh, yes. there really is a, a chance for a, a, an epochal shift in economic thinking, do you think? Yes. Yes. I, I, well, in the case of Boris Johnson, it helps that you don't have any principles or believe in anything in the first place. I mean, <laughs> That's I cynical, but true. <laughs> I mean, that, but that, that is, can be an advantage at times like this if you don't believe in anything, so it means you don't betray any of your beliefs. Um, what about um, those yes. who don't understand anything on oh, this yes, side of the Atlantic? That, that, that could be true too. I, I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> but the, the, um, what, you, what this does mean at this point um, is... In many ways, the central banks have spent the last 10 years, as everybody knows, keeping interest rates incredibly low, trying to nurse the private sector through after the crisis, um, with the result that the Great Recession was not as bad as many assumed it was going to be, including myself, but that the recovery afterwards has been much worse than uh, many assumed it ought to be, and that uh, inequality has deepened, um, which isn't necessarily a trade-off many would have accepted or realised they were making 10 or 11 years ago. At this point, um, the uh, central banks have gone as far as they can. To some extent, the action of the last week or two has been central banks just saying, OK, we are just going to do all we can do now so that it, there's complete clarity, this is what we can do, everything else is going to be up to the politicians. Um, and that I feel that a lot of the criticism of central banks over the last few years has perhaps been somewhat misdirected in that a lot of central bankers have been uncomfortable about what they've been doing, but they've been filling a gap left by politicians who couldn't agree on significant stimulus it couldn't agree on uh, doing the things needed to, to to get the economy jolted back into uh, action um there was a stimulus um probably not as big enough one but there was a stimulus here under barack obama uh in the uk uh under david cameron you know the uk enthusiastically adopted the notion of uh, of um of uh, austerity um, and then in the eurozone you have the uh, you've you've got the long-term uh, German belief which is written into their constitution of avoiding big deficits um, so to some extent or to a great extent I think the uh, the problems for central banks the the, the, ro the reason central banks have taken such a big role in the economy is because governments didn't they weren't prepared to do so either for reasons of lack of courage or for reasons of uh, um, political manoeuvring, which might have been the case here when Republicans were passionate about the deficit until they got to spend the money, at which point they didn't mind deficits so much. Um, at this point, um, what we've seen from the way the bond market is shrieked in the way that it has is a clear sign that n now is the time when there is no avoiding it the government has to do something um, and again whether it's whether they understand this or not that has a lot to do with why you've seen politicians like the Conservative Party in the UK like Angela Merkel who um, 
uh, is to the right of the German censor, although that makes her a very different politician from right of Central Americans, for example, and the Republicans in the Senate here in the States. Um, the argument now is over exactly how to spend large amounts of money, and there are some important principled arguments going on, but the argument over whether to spend money has disappeared in the last few weeks. There is almost no concern about it anymore. Uh, it's taken as, it's taken almost red. Uh, and what you also see, I suspect, this is, this is basically a reversal of orthodoxy since um, you know, Paul Volcker takes power in, uh, at the Fed in 1979, then Thatcher and then Reagan. There was a period at the end of the 70s and to the beginning of the 80s when um, there was a clear decision that uh, the developed world was going to go with the Reagan-Thatcher model for a while. Uh, I think the Reagan-Thatcher model, you know, finally uh, ran out of ground in the financial crisis uh, and nobody has particularly wanted to try to do the very difficult job of finding a different way to run the economy. Um, and very, very strangely, it's a virus from Wuhan uh, that has forced the issue. Um, but I, 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 am, I don't think there's really any doubt that this is the beginning of a, of a new economic order. There was the post-war economic order when currencies, currencies were fixed. You had the Bretton Woods Agreement, you had the Marshall Plan and so on. Uh, that gave way after 70s stagflation to the, you know, the much more laissez-faire Reagan-Thatcher way of doing things something new is going to have to emerge now. Um, whether it's, where you would put it on a political spectrum is very interesting because you know, there are certain aspects of economics like protectionism, for example, where the left and the right can unite against the center. Um, but something different is going to happen. This, um, what if, the way we're going to have to grope our way towards a, a different way of running the economy from the way that's been in vogue for the last 40 years. You're making me very gloomy because if there's going to be a new economic order, looking around the world at yeah. the um, level of political leadership and statesperson-like um, behavior yeah. around the globe, have you ever seen a less well-equipped bunch of statesmen, statespeople <laughs> to, to, to inaugurate anything, let alone a new economic order? Uh, it's, it's, it's certainly that's a very alarming, that's a, a very, worrying part of the entire the entire equation um with the exception of angela merkel who has really been around a bit but who is also supposed to be leaving next year um sorry she's supposed to be leaving at the end of this year um uh you know the, there are no major leaders on the stage who have uh, who have developed um, a great deal of uh, deal of uh, respect or very great following um, and obviously you also have um, much more dissension between countries than you had at the beginning of the the last crisis um, what you know George W Bush was um, we, we all have our opinions about George W Bush but he was a very different kind of a president from um, from Donald Trump and he was certainly far more uh, concerned to uh, coordinate economic policy or to, to maintain whatever, you know, the Pax Americana or whatever you would like to call it than, than Trump has been. Uh, so yes, I agree with you. There is, a, there is an acute problem of leadership that's present. It's not well, clear. Well, there has to be when we, well, when we have a consensus that George W. Bush was misunderestimated. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> we are down there. Yes. Yes. Um, do you have so, any questions? Uh, I was going to say, have, have we got any questions out there? If you could email them in. We have problems with bandwidth because everybody in Manhattan is hunkering down watching their favorite cable channel at the same mm. time. So we really are. I had faster bandwidth in the Mekong Delta than I do in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. <laughs> so, uh, if I, <laughs> okay, here they're coming through. What will be the implications of the higher national debt for the economy? Will there be implications? Are we in the detached from reality point again, John? Well, that, that, that is one of the interesting discussions that, that's 
that we see at the moment. Um, the argument of modern monetary theory, um, which uh, is a buzzword for a group of uh, economists, uh, one of the best known ones in, in this country is Stephanie Kelton, who has been advising Bernie Sanders. Um, but you can't say that it's, this is another one of those fascinating things where it's not just a left-wing cause. There are um, Adair Turner, who is former head of the CBI, the British Employers uh, Organization, uh, and a former, I think he was deputy governor of the, the Bank of England. So you're plainly not a figure of the, of the left, is also in favor of these broad, this broad set of ideas. It's again, it's one of these strange things where normal labels break down. The notion of modern monetary theory is um, you can create more money if you want to, uh, and uh, that should stimulate the economy. If there isn't enough activity going on in the economy already, it won't create inflation. Um, we will. Uh, it looks as though we are going to be having a large economic experiment in real time to find out whether that's true. Plainly, many one of the big arguments of the, the opponents of MMT was that uh, just the buying of assets, the, uh, the, the, the uh, low interest rates of the last 10 years would create inflation. And they were wrong. It didn't create inflation in general goods and prices. It tended only to create inflation um, in specific um, assets that were of a particular, you know, of either in asset prices in markets or or in things like educational tuition and housing. Um, so you could argue that it is possible, given the uh, weakness of economic activity, the low velocity of money, to take on this amount of debt to, uh, for the government to issue that kind of you know, huge extra issuance of bonds uh, without uh, negatively impacting the economy, without what has happened in the past when governments have borrowed that much is that people have been more reluctant to borrow, they've demanded a higher interest rate, uh, and those interest rates ha have made it harder for the government to uh, service its own debt, and they've squeezed the life out of the economy. That's the uh, way things did work um, in much of the, uh, the post-war era. Um, as we've that that is the argument that I think is probably going to prevail. That things are so weak at this point that we can take a risk and borrow an awful lot of money, and um, we're not actually going to require. You know, we're not going to squeeze the life out of the economy, possibly also sarcastically because there's no life in the economy anyway. So we can't. There's, we can't squeeze the life out of it, or it's a like the person who's driving a three-wheeled car, they just want a speeding ticket because they'd be so delighted it could go that fast. You know, there is the risk that it's uh, simply... Uh, that is the argument. Well, in we have a question from the other side of the, the axis of epidemics in Portland, Oregon. Uh, oh, yeah. How does a small business move forward? Business as usual, as much as possible? Or how can one lead the way towards a better deal, a better model? Is, is that within well, your... Small business sort of tend to deal with the big picture. Okay, sure. I mean, for small businesses, it's, a, it's, it's very difficult. I mean, if, you, if you're talking about for the next few weeks, again, my understanding of epidemiology is that uh, it, it, it's going to be best for all of us if we just shut stuff down, and that will be awful for people running a small business, plainly, um, which is, again, why there, there's obviously a need to, to nurture small businesses through um, in whatever way is is possible with a lot of with a lot of state aid um i, I mean in terms of uh, uh, if, the, if the questioner could just send, send another uh, can you repeat the question again would it, how would they uh well uh, uh, there another what are they supposed to do are they just carry on business as normal that <laughs> they're, they're, they're supposed uh, i mean uh, <laughs> What do I think governments should require of them? I, I mean, what, what is being required of them at the moment is that governments are asking them to just stop their business and go without money, uh, which is why politicians across the spectrum are accepting that the government needs to pay them some money. 
um, because I don't think anybody is attempting to argue that uh, that uh, it, it, it's healthy to allow small businesses to go to the wall. Um, a debt holiday is one of the most obvious ways to to uh, to deal with the issue. Um, uh, government help for rent is another. That's you know the, the, there are nice clear contracts there. You can you can uh, fill in fill in the gaps quite quite directly there. If there are if you again if you've got clear contracts with employees, then governments can at least pay this remarkable step that the Boris Johnson government took of paying 80% of the salary of, uh, of people who are forcibly temporarily laid off due to the virus. Well, the, um, the, the question has just come up with the question I was about to follow on from this because um, said, what about a debt jubilee across the board? And uh, of course, this is an ancient Old Testament tradition, so it might appeal to the <laughs> fundamentalists in, in Washington well, and, and down south, uh, a seventh year <laughs> jubilee, all debts are written <laughs> off, all slaves manumitted, etc. I personally, uh, we're, we're going to see that kind of idea is going to, to make itself heard more and more, yes. Um, the scale, um, uh, and it is true <clears throat> that it can be done. You can just, you, you, you can create the money with a click, with a click of a computer. Um, whether a full-blown jubilee of forgiving all debt in perpetuity is going to be a good idea. Uh, you do have the issue of moral hazard. Um, broadly speaking, um, people need to repay their debts and they need to know that there will be a penalty for not repaying their debts or otherwise you'll get badly run businesses, you'll get embezzlement, you'll get all kinds of Wrong incentives. A Soviet you know. economy just before the collapse, in fact. Yes, yes, it's it, exactly. You you either get you, are, you, you no no economic model works unless there is some degree of uh, of risk of failure, some reason to be honest, uh, and some reason to be efficient. Um, in terms of a debt jubilee, like um, I, I mean, it's a very ambitious thing to do, but it's a wonderful way to present the issue. Uh, like how could the Southern Baptist nobody resist needs, nobody the needs Lord's to repay and, <laughs> uh, yeah, nobody needs to repay for until until the virus is out until until we give the all clear for the virus or something like that if you can if you can arrange something along those lines then you can make people very excited um, uh, it costs an awful lot of money again there is a question whether it's it's conceivable that that doesn't matter while economic activity is so slow. We've um, got a question just come in from uh, yeah. our former president in Uruguay. Uh, he wants to know if there's been any evidence of um, Chinese purchasing of major global listed corporations while there's a bargain basement or even a sub-basement at the moment. <laughs> no, uh, no, there hasn't been any, any evidence of that yet. And that's obviously a very big political issue in itself. One of the things that's <clears throat> fascinating about the situation we're in is that is that um for a long time the fear was that china held a lot of government debt i.e it's it's, it's it's lent a it's bought a lot of u.s treasury bonds with the parking the money that it had made through its um export surplus through its positive trade balance um and this led to the fear that China could deliberately sell those treasury bonds, which would push yields up, push interest rates up within the American economy. Um, plainly, they're not doing that at the moment because bond yields are remarkably low. Um, the other thing, though, that is fascinating is that two months ago, um, I think there were many people who thought that the, the time was up for the contemporary Chinese model. The initial handling in Wuhan was obviously very bad. There was a lot of dissent about it that was well broadcast in the, in the Western media. Um, and what you have instead seen is that um, the Chinese response appears to have been very successful. 
uh, and I've got a piece coming out tomorrow. If you look at uh, the performance of the Chinese stock market compared to the rest of the world, it's been just about the best performing stock market this year, um, even though the coronavirus started there, uh, and even though the most recent economic numbers for China are very bad. Um, part of that uh, is because there is a sense that actually the, the regime somehow did manage to adapt, come up with a way of dealing with this quickly enough, that was successful enough, that it maintains its sense of legitimacy. Um, uh, part of it is just the, 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 the happy accident that there was a lot of pressure on China because, on, uh, because local Chinese people were worried about the amount of debt in the Chinese economy, wanting to move their money offshore. There is far less pressure to do that now because uh, everywhere else in the world, it. <laughs> yeah, where would you want to put it? Uh, so there's far less pressure on the on the Chinese authorities there. Um, if they wanted to be so assertive as to, to to start trying to buy in domestic markets, that's that's another question. I think I there are political mechanisms to to block that, uh, and I imagine they would probably be used in the developed world at any rate. Whether you would whether you would find. Um, I know the, the region of the world which in terms of its debt and its equities has been most hit in the last two or three months, very counterintuitively, is Latin America. Um, basically because when things get bad, it always seems to be poor old Latin America that gets it in the neck more than anybody else. Um, you know, there is less demand for industrial metals, copper, the various things they dig out of the ground in in uh, in the Andes. Uh, is it possible that you would see a deepening of the Chinese influence in Latin America coming out of this? Yes, I can see that. Um, there's no, and the question was from Uruguay, right? Yeah, okay, yes, I, yeah. I can imagine that happening. I'm not aware of any evidence of it happening so far. But remember that the, the top for most world stock markets was still only a month ago. It's whatever it is, it's the 23rd of March today and um, the, the world's stock market index and the US stock market index hit all time highs on February the 19th. It's remarkable how quickly the virus has wiped out values and changed the entire global market situation in the global economy. Mm. I, was, I was also thinking, I mean, this yeah. is a perfect storm in a sense because just on its own i mean the virus is a precipitating factor but i think you've implied in the past that this yeah. is a bubble just waiting for anything coming along to prick yes. it and uh, i mean exactly. the, the boeing crisis for a start i mean the economy has a remarkably similar trajectory to that of a 387 max when the air, when the um, <laughs> autopilot kicks in yes it's it, uh, and that that's a very that's a very good point it comes back to what i was i was saying earlier this this isn't like 2000 where people had bid up the market too high, uh, but there wasn't a lot of leverage out there. there. There's an awful lot of debt that that a lot of smaller American companies are relying upon, um, and a lot of companies that appear to be, you know, the, the technical term is zombie companies, companies that don't actually, that uh, are only able to survive because borrowing costs are so low, but they're not actually growing, they're not making profits. Um, so you have this sort of, um, you know, horrible middle ground where you don't have the, the creative destruction or the discipline that comes with capitalism, but you also don't have the, you know, the attempts at fairness, the attempts at some kind of degree of planning that might come with, with the, you know, the traditional alternatives to capitalism. It's, it's um, and that's a very dangerous situation. Um, One of the fashions we've discussed recently that was uh, that was, was the whole question of share buybacks, and, and yes. now we discover that most of the airlines that are got their begging bowl out, they don't have any money because they bought their shares back. In effect, they handed them yep. over to their executive in bonuses. Um, yes, no, that, that's another very interesting area where, where you'd seen a lot of movements in the last year or two before the crisis. Sorry, this current crisis, and, and where you're likely to see much more movement. Uh, some of the biggest 
advocates of corporate governance have moved away from the notion, and this comes from Milton Friedman, the, you know, the Svengali figure behind Thatcher and Reagan, that the sole purpose of the corporation is to raise shareholder value, to, to raise the, that you go out there as, as a capitalist, go out, make money, try to make your employees and your shareholders richer, they can then, if they're richer, choose to give money to charity and so on. That you just about growing the pie, making more, making more profit, uh, was the notion, which isn't a self-evidently stupid notion, um, but it's come under increasing attack, uh, as you've seen the growth in, in ESG, um, environmental social governance investing. Um, and you did, you had seen a lot of people coming up with the notion that uh, uh, you needed to maximize stakeholder value or corporate fat or, or um, global value, social value. There is, um, there's a book that uh, I'm supposed to be reviewing at the moment called, called Growing the Pie uh, by a British academic, which is, which has the notion that uh, uh, you shouldn't be thinking about making maximizing profits for your own company you should be thinking of trying to grow the entire pie and ultimately that probably will be better for all the constellation of people involved in your company um, share buybacks plainly directly benefit shareholders because you're taking money and paying shareholders with it uh, and but you're not actually you're buying the shares back on the presumption because everybody's told you that this raises the share prices i'm not quite, i've never seen that demonstrably oh uh, i mean it, it, it raises earnings per share because it reduces the number of shares yes of course uh, yeah. and all other things equal higher <laughs> earnings per share will tend to raise share prices um does it have a strong an effect uh, as many assume no uh, i mean the other point was that it, it does have some tax advantages compared to, to paying out dividends yeah, yeah. But um, I mean, at the moment, the other advantage is that it means that all of these airliners have spent all of their spare cash, you know, yes. what they're supposed to have kept during the fat years ready for the lean years. And uh, exactly, exactly. now they want the government to pay them <laughs> because they've got no, no money left to keep them going during a bad patch. And, and this is where we are seeing what, one of the fascinating uh, disjunctions in global finance. And again, if people have questions, I can try sending some of the, the material on this. There are, there are two ways in which corporate profits are measured here in the States. There's companies themselves publish their results under GAAP, generally, generally accepted accounting practices, um, where you're may, allowed to make uh, assumptions about bad loans, about depreciation, amortization, all that kind of thing. Uh, and they also report uh, their uh, earnings to the government for tax purposes, which then becomes part of the national income and um, profit accounts, the the, the uh, formal profit accounts that go into the calculating GDP, and normally they will vary a bit over time, which isn't necessarily that sinister. Companies do need to, you know, there's some exceptional event in one way or another. A prudent accountant takes account of it, um, but they have really parted company in the last ten years. That 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 earnings per share in uh, American companies have continued to rise, whereas the numbers they've reported to the government have basically been the same for about seven or eight years. And, um, and now earnings per share of the S&P had plainly showed signs of beginning a decline even before the virus struck. Um, a large part of that has been that um, the reason the share price share prices have risen as much as they have is that companies have managed to juice up their value to shareholders but they've done it in such a way as to reduce drastically their room for maneuver they've taken their cash and immediately paid it back they they're no longer acting in a acting with a with a cushion they are trying to maximize short-term profits uh and yes in particularly in the case of the airlines this is an extremely dangerous precedent. Uh, we're, we're now seeing the problem because airlines always have been um, prone to go bankrupt over the years. Um, at the moment, they're flying on empty. Yes, exactly. Well, they're, they're, and many of them were allowed. This is another part of why um, 
profits have gone up as in the profits that shareholders receive because there has been far more consolidation. Um, American industry, to its credit, has been much more genuine, genuinely competitive than in many countries in Western Europe, um, which does mean that you get more of the benefits of competition and capitalism if there's more companies around there. Uh, there has been the, the, there's been much more of a lenient approach to antitrust uh, under Obama as well as under uh, G. W. Bush. Uh, and you now see uh, a much, much more concentrated American industries in many different industrial sectors. And that, again, means that you can make greater profits without necessarily really selling more things, really producing better products, doing the things that make people happier and make the economy grow. Um, so, yes, but, but the, the bottom line is that this, the virus reveals a lot of the things that have been done over the last 10 years to to raise share prices but not actually really stimulate the economy or stimulate anybody's feeling of well-being well john i think we're, we're reaching the end now we've prevailed upon you for an hour now um have you really? got any sort of snappy send-off like we're doomed we're doomed <laughs> or, um... we're not i i don't think we do i i think um i i mean i'm, I'm quite glad in some ways, I've been covering, you know, global markets and the economy for, you know, 30 years. Since I was two. That was a joke. I'm not, sadly, I'm not 32. Um, I'm quite glad that it's come at this point because the next few years are going to be fascinating. Um, and with any luck, again, I am not an epidemiologist. I, Nothing is going to be good about whatever horror awaits us. I don't know what the death toll is going to be. I'm very apprehensive about that. Um, but it does offer a chance for um, people to see what they can do to actually run the economy well. We've, we've seen various models that have, attempted, that have seemed to work for a while and then run out of speed uh, in human history over the last hundred years. Um, whatever comes out of this turmoil that we're in at the moment will be recognizably different from, you know, we're not going back to anything remotely like Soviet model communism. We're not going, I don't think we're going back to European corporatism. We're not going back to Thatcher Reagan attempts at laissez-faire or Calvin Coolidge attempts at laissez-faire. It's going to be something new again. Um, and that will be very interesting for us all to behold. Well, um, from the Foreign Policy uh, Association, John, I have to thank you deeply um, for a, an exposition in these trying times um, and uh, making it intelligible and using numbers to explain rather than to obscure reality. So thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, all the attendee, attenders. And um, we hope to see you again later in the week on a, a virtual Caribbean beach, we hope. Thank you for joining us for this broadcast. To learn more about our digital forums and programs, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. For membership information, please visit www.foreignpressassociation.org and on Twitter at FBA New York. This has been an exclusive presentation of the Foreign Press Association.